Greetings, my dudes. I bring to you today part two of season one of Tower of God. Check out part one if you missed it. Anyway, when we last left off, Yoru dreams about Rachel while unconscious. As she requests that Kun convince him that she isn't Rachel, she believes that they are weaker if they are together and insists that they stay apart. Kun doesn't agree with this. Rack is concerned for Black Turtle. Meanwhile, Black March doesn't like women and especially doesn't like tracksuit. Androsi creeps up on Anak and tells her about Yuri, the genius fisherman princess. Kun silently apologizes to Yoru about Rachel, and the little devil awakens after having been asleep for five days. Sometime in the past, Lero gives everyone the rundown on the classes. Fishermen, who serve as the frontline infantry, spear bearers, who wield long pointy sticks, light bearers, who are kind of like strategists and commanders, scouts, who are self-explanatory, and wave controllers, who are cool shinsu wizards. Yoru is assigned the role of wave controller, and is told his training begins tomorrow. He asks about Rachel, of course, which results in Kun fulfilling Rachel's request. Yoru stands outside of Michelle Light's room while he struggles over understanding her reasons. She seems conflicted. Later, at Din Din, Kun speculates with Yoru on Rachel's justifications and convinces him to become stronger, so she will want to climb the tower together. Rack agrees. At Hogwarts, the Onigiri wizard explains that to use Shinsu effectively, one must form a contract on each floor. The students summon their balls, then do just that. Yoru is sucked into a vacuous undersea turtle cave and is contracted with some kind of god, probably, who warns him that the nature of this contract is more like a shackle. Yoru apologizes to the red-haired lady, who was formerly a latex insect. Ho and Laro introduce themselves, while Yoru contemplates his weaknesses in in comparison to them. Ho was just putting up a tough front, though. The spear boy training was fairly intense, and Rack decided to return to the wild for supplemental education. This motivates Yoru. Suddenly, more people show up with requests. Meanwhile, Rachel is in agony over Yoru finding friends. She ate a million chocolates in despair. All the regulars get together during lunch like longtime homies. Shibisu reveals that the scout's assignment is to make friends. Ten friends in a week, to be specific. Back in time, Shibi and Hats cut ties with Anak because she is green and aggressive. Hats and Kun become enraged and negotiations break down. Yoru intervenes though, allowing their alliance to form, and Dorsey rejects Shibisu's advances, but seems friendly. Suddenly, Anak arrives to pee on their social gathering. She outs in Dorsey as a princess and refuses to return Black March. Yoru has forgiven her like a good boy and asks about her lineage, to which Kun responds by explaining that the princesses of Jihad are not related by blood, but rather are representatives of capable tribes and families. Speaking of troublesome women, Rachel. The fisherman's test is to knock each other off these large platforms. Anak immediately attacks Endorsi with the proposition that all princesses of Jihad are imposters. Kun watches Rack pass his test from these cubes and peeps on everyone else. He reads a Wikipedia article on Anak, a ranker who was selected as a princess and granted Green April. He finds it suspicious that a ranker would be taking the test to climb the tower while she launches people into the abyss. Oh, it turns out that Anak is registered as deceased. And Dorsey bounds around, deftly kicks this guy into the pit, then taunts Anak, who juices herself with Shinsu for a sneak attack. And Dorsey explodes her, then speculates that she is Anak's orphan. Endometriosis becomes sincere, and questions Anak's mother's path of misfortune. I guess that means that Anak is technically Endorsey's niece? It's a small alien with a shiny rock, living a peaceful life with her cool mom. She responds by stating that her mother was happy, until the princesses of Jihad murdered her and her husband. And Anak's reason for climbing the tower is revenge. Suspenseful cliffhanger. God explains that Jihad was the first fella to climb the tower, and that his princesses are forbidden to bear children to prevent the biological spread of the power they were given. Cut to mommy Anak and her daughter, then to Anak screaming. And Dorsey attempts to explain how Anak's existence is a crime, having gained Jihad's power without the hardship of training to become a princess. This only makes her more enraged. And Dorsey's heel breaks again. She should probably just wear sneakers at this point. She is pushed into the abyss, taking Anak along with her. They insult each other at the bottom. Then Endorsi asks whether Anak's mother regretted her actions, inciting a flashback to when they were separated, and then another of them being blissful. Meanwhile, the wizards shoot little Shinsus at some balloons. Yoru is strong. Ho is pathetic. Yoru thanks Lero for helping him hone the correct technique in exchange for saving his precious sleep. Ho is jealous and sinister. Lero picks up on this. So does the 
red-haired lady. Kun informs Yoru about the princess's scuffle yesterday and comments on their folly. Shibo is forlorn after struggling to acquire the ten friends he needs. Yoru offers his assistance, and Kun agrees to help after being swayed by his weaponized innocence. And Dorsey has a broken leg, an empty wallet, and an appetite for sustenance, a perfect opportunity for the scouts to take advantage. And so she becomes a friend. An act falls for Kun's scheming as well. Hats becomes indebted to him, much to his dissatisfaction. Rachel has been subsisting off of apples. They discuss princesses at the dinner table. Then in Dorsey goes to speak with Rachel. She doesn't understand why Rachel is distancing herself so fervently from Yoru, and openly questions whether reaching the tower's peak is worth more than him. Glare. Chomp. Ho finds it strange that Yoru has become so powerful during their training, contemplating his own inferiority and the trauma of being mass harvested for ivory. He receives a mysterious letter hosting some spicy information. Yuhan and his gremlins discuss the next test, a game of tag. Lero is conflicted about Quant being the proctor due to his reputation for having imbecilic tendencies. And so it begins. Rack and this big guy have automatically passed already. 28 participants are divided into two teams and scored on individual performance. Yoru and Kun are on opposite teams. Yuhan explains that the game of tag has two players who are it, one chosen by the administrators and the other a fisherman from the regulars. In order to win, they must help their team's it reach the goal or tag the administrator's it by stealing their badge. If the admin's it takes a team's badge, then that team loses. Quant reveals himself to be the admin's it. Kun strategizes with his group, making use of Shibi as bait. It works. Quant incapacitates one of their cube bearers and falls right into Kun's trap. Anak goes for the capture, but fails, only serving to make Quanto go feral with rage. Lero laments Quant's prideful idiosyncrasies. Quant regains composure and gives the examinees 111 seconds to rethink their strategy. They all get going while he laughs maniacally. The big boys contemplate Kun's strategy. Meanwhile, Endorsi settles Yoru's nervous twitching. He asks about Rachel, but doesn't receive any useful information. Anak heads up to the goal via elevator while Kun strategizes. Quant is released from his numerical prison as Kun instructs his army, which has spread out along the stairs, to lure Quant to the exit if their plan fails. He pulls a sneaky on them, darting in and out of the shadows and striking the examinees as he ascends the stairs under a barrage of Shinsu bullets. Yori becomes concerned that Rachel won't be able to continue her climb if Kun wins right now. Anak makes it to the top, but the stairs have been lost. Shibi prepares to unleash his killing arts, while Rack and the other big guy furiously eat chocolates. Lero calls Team A's loss, stating that it's only a matter of time before Quant catches Anak. Rack has faith in Blue Turtle, though. Shibisu is eviscerated by the Proctor, despite his enthusiasm. Kun awaits Quant at the exit and convinces him that Anak jumped to a different exit using her princess powers. The reality is that Kun used his lighthouse as an elevator to stow Nak away. Unfortunately, Quant figured it out already by sensing the Shinsu within Kun's cube. To spite Kun's tactics, Squat jumps off the ledge with him in tow, all part of the plan. Anak makes it to the end, while Kun dangles from Green April. Yoru celebrates, but Team A's victory means that his team automatically loses, probably. Lero is shook, Quant is enraged, then approached by an enigmatic figure. Team A has miraculously lost. Kun is depressed. Everyone cheers him up though. He reflects on what happened. Lero and Kun actually sabotaged their win by launching Quant to the exit. Lero is confused by the betrayal, but Yuhan whips out evidence of Kun's real team. Kun's plan was actually to pave the way for Team B to pass instead. Quant is frustrated at being used so thoroughly. Meanwhile, Yoru's team squabbles over leadership, and Dorsey becomes their commander and assigns their it. Hats explains her plan to these spear goons, while Ho bites his fingernails. Serena has second thoughts about ascending the tower after becoming friends with everyone. Right before being invited to the tower, her friends were slaughtered by a rancor during a failed heist. Ho reveals his sinister feelings about climbing the tower no matter what. Quant begins to ascend the stairs, then Endorsi thwacks her teammate with a sly giggle. Everyone is shook. Endorsi monologues about the trauma she endured to become a princess of Jihad. She murdered everyone to get where she is now. Her plan was to sabotage to begin with, to guarantee her passing position amongst the fishermen. This guy gets thwacked again. Same with this guy. Endorsi then presents her deception as a learning experience for 
Ryoru to strengthen his character so he can stand by Rachel. Hats and his spear clowns begin their fight with Quant. Meanwhile, Serena is abandoned by Ho, and Dorsey finished off her opponents, much to Yoru's dismay. However, and Dorsey doesn't really care, and they continue to have an ideological bout. Their verbal disagreement is interrupted by Sword Boy's sinister green blast. Hats keeps Quant distracted, but can't compare to his overwhelming rancor strength. He invokes the power of fellowship, but his allies have fled. Quant is even more peeved due to their betrayal. Yoru took the full force of the detonation to heroically protect Indoor. Rachel cubes and is approached by Ho, who whips out a knife, taking Rachel hostage. If he ices Rachel, Yoru will theoretically lose motivation. Team A's observation cubes are deactivated due to the various unforeseen events. Lero is nervous, but Yu Han doesn't care. Yoru regains his strength and self-motivates by reciting the good boy ethics he was taught by Rachel. His resolve is adamant. He must protect Rachel till the end. Ho figures that Rachel will be an excellent lure. He wants to climb so bad, but Quant is here and indignant. Serena is confused. Ho suddenly finds himself trapped between the rancor, his prey, and the crushing realization that he was tricked. He goes nuts from the frustration and uses Rachel to sick Yoru on Quant. Quant paralyzes Yoru with some Shinsu, then tells him to take care of Ho. Rachel becomes feisty and is run through. Ho is seamlessly obliterated by Quant's insta-paraplegic technique. Quap is shook. Rachel is kill. No. This big guy also disappears somehow. Ho explains his reasoning, but Yoru's innocence can't comprehend his betrayal. He continues to monologue about his tragic backstory with tears in his eyes, and with one final declaration of his hatred for Yoru, does a Sudoku puzzle. Serena shows up to grieve. Yoru also grieves, and Dorsey emerges from the darkness to inspect the goings on. Serena slaps the silly out of her for betraying Team B, but Dorsey remains composed. Indo asserts that she has also found someone to climb the tower with. And that Yoru should find his own way to ascend by using her subterfuge as an example of the lengths he must go to. She leaves with the parting words, people can't have everything. The day always comes when they lose something, so keep moving forward so you won't regret it. Rachel. Quant and Dorsey begin their duel for victory. Yoru gets involved too with his new ability. Meanwhile, Serena speaks with Ho's corpse about the reality of their struggles with those who have power. And Dorsey's words about regret had some effect on her, and she ponders what the outcome would be if she gave her absolute all. Quant easily captures Team B's badge, while Serena mourns over Ho. The rancor was tricked again, however, and the game ends. Quant is enraged. Ho and Rachel get carted off. Team A is shook, and that's the end of part two of season one of Tower of God. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, like, comment, or subscribe. I have a Patreon for those who want to buy me pants. Uh, that's it. Thanks again. Bye.